Hello, thank you for joining us for this pro professional learning opportunity. I am Scott Mathias from NCEA, and I will be your host today. Today's webinar, Seeing as God Sees, is being led by Deacon Matthew Halbach. Deacon Halbach was ordained in 2018 for the Diocese of Des Moines, Iowa. He is Executive Director of Catechesis for William H. Sadlier and a major contributor to Sadlier's newest catechetical program, Christ in Us. Deacon Halbach is also a national author and speaker on the topics of mercy, accompaniment, clergy abuse, evangelization, and catechesis. Before I turn it over to Deacon Halbach, let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Father, we ask for your guidance during these times and for your wisdom to be imparted to each of us as we listen to the information being presented today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Deacon Halbach, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Scott. Okay, everybody. So hopefully you can see my screen and hopefully you know where your chat box is because we're going to be using it several times during our retreat together. So if you would, if you would mind, just put the letter Y or the word yes in the chat box. Let me know that you're able to get to it and use it. So as Scott said, our, our retreat title today is Seeing as God Sees. Um, the subtitle, A Faith-Based Vision for Self-Transformation. Thanks, Barbara and Rachel. A, a Faith-Based Vision for Self-Transformation. We're going to talk a lot about how we are transformed by our faith, and in particularly by a, our faith-filled way of seeing, seeing ourselves, seeing other people, seeing the world, seeing God. So what we're going to talk about today, and this is actually built as a much longer retreat. Uh, I just mentioned to Scott that I had done this last Friday for the Archdiocese of Chicago's uh, school teachers. Um, it's part of their PD that they do every semester. Um, and that was two and a half hours long. Well, we don't have two and a half hours together. So we will be moving through some slides fairly quickly and some we are just going to skip all together. But we are going to keep the content connected and we'll keep the theme very cogent and concise. So don't worry about uh, feeling short shrifted or we're not getting the full message. We're definitely gonna get it. But what we'll talk about today is what it means to see as God sees, why this is an important way of seeing, and then how do we do this? And I wanna caution at the beginning that we're not talking about a technique. I really hesitate to use that kind of word when we talk about anything spiritual or faith-based. Um, while that we might practice certain behaviors and certain dispositions that can support our faith and growth and faith. Uh, I don't think technique's probably the right word. It's more like just a disposition or an openness, an orientation to encountering Christ and to being led by the Holy Spirit. So I have a verse here on the screen, which comes from the book of Acts. In him we live and move and have our being. One of the things we do as human beings is we use that faculty of sight and in the case of uh, the faith we we don't use our physical eyes as much as we use the eyes of our heart and we'll talk about that in just a moment a, a phrase or a word i like to call cardio vision uh, we're very kind of health conscious i think as a society uh, many people working on cardio and i would like to encourage people to be working on their cardio vision that is seeing from their heart and uh, seeing through the context of their faith in Jesus Christ, which is, as this verse bears out, is our whole orientation for life. So we don't just make right choices because of our faith, or we don't just believe certain things because of our faith. We also see things a certain way, right? We understand life in a certain way, and we relate to life in a certain way because of it. Here we have an image of a tightrope walker. And I got to move my camera up here so I can see everything. We have a tightrope walker and a little cross position, which is great because we're staying connected with that image of Christ and the focus of our faith. Um, and there's a little uh, verse on the right that it's not what's in front of you, but what's beyond you that matters. If you think about your faith and you think about walking in tightrope, tightrope walkers hardly ever <laughs> look down. Sometimes life really does feel like that tightrope. Sometimes it's really a balancing act. There are forces, gravity of, of situations and events in our lives, gravity of feelings that really pulls us down, weighs us down. 
tightrope walkers don't like to look down very much at their feet, particularly if they're very high up. They tend to keep their eyes focused on what's what's ahead of them, what's down the wire, so to speak, or or down the road down for us, what's down the journey of faith. And we don't always see clearly what that is, but we know we have to keep moving forward. And it's that guidance of the spirit that allows us to make that balanced move and many steps forward on a journey. We don't know every uh, outcome or where that journey ultimately uh, leads as far as our destiny here. We do know that in the end, uh, this journey of faith leads us to, to heaven and that ultimate destiny. We have a, a verse from Romans here I'd like you to take a look at, Romans 12, 2. I'll just be quiet for a moment, give you a chance to read that. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Part of that is how you think about things, and part of how you think about things is how you actually see things. Uh, we even link seeing sight with thinking. So, for example, someone might say after discovering a solution to a problem, oh, I see that now. I see that solution now. It's, it's very interesting to me, the linkage between sight and discovery or sight and uh, solutions, sight and thinking. So if we want to change how we think about something, we have to start seeing something differently. So let, what I'd like to do now is a, little, a very short Lexio Divina experience with you. I have a few verses on the right hand side there of the slide. Uh, take a moment in silence to look at those verses. And if you would, in the chat box, please put a word or a phrase that really jumps off the page at you, something that that resounds with you, connects with you. And then I'd like to offer a little reflection. Conviction, thank you. I think a lot what, what the, the unseen is are the eternal things in that first verse from Corinthians. That really brings my mind to the creed that we say every Sunday, that he's the creator of all things seen and unseen. And, you know, our, our Catholic imagination might might stop at things like angels. Well, we don't usually see them uh, or th um, th sort of these really out of this world kind of thing. But what's interesting about our Catholic faith is how it teaches us. And first of all, it proposes to us and then it trains us to kind of have these sacramental eyes these way these eyes that that see the appearance of things but then also recognize something underneath that's that's more transcendent something underneath that's present that is uh more rooted in the beyond or in this case in god and we even call those things transcendentals like goodness beauty and truth and oneness but think about the sacra sacraments themselves for example i celebrate baptism sometimes as a deacon and and uh, sometimes it's almost as if I step out of my, myself and look at what's going on around the baptismal font. And you see, you know, you see the baby, you see the family and the godparents. Uh, you hear the prayers. Uh, you see the minister tracing the sign of the cross. You see the pouring of water over the child's head. Um, but just it's our faith that tells us that what's happening here is Christ is bringing another person into the father's family. Uh, another wonderful celebration of spiritual adoption, uh, which is what Paul calls baptism. And so with the sacraments, the church tries to train us to recognize that in life, there, there's always things happening. There's always a context. There's always an environment. There's always a landscape. But within all of that, God is present and working. And it's about learning to, to discover that, training our eyes, if you will, the eyes of our heart, to see that. So let's talk about cardiovision for a little bit. And I I'm, was very happy to find this image. I thought it was perfect. And sometimes you search on Google images and you can't find anything that you need or you find things you absolutely don't want to use. Um, but this is perfect. That little picture of the heart in that person's eye. To begin to talk about cardiovision, I'd like to do a second Lexio with you. You have a couple of verses on the right side of the slide. Please take a moment to read them for yourself. 
And then in the chat box, please note any words or phrases that really speak to you. Blessed. Thank you, Rachel. How about that second verse? Did you ever catch that verse before from the letter to the Ephesians? I know I didn't, not until preparing for this retreat. What a profound verse uh, that we have these eyes, the eyes of our hearts, and that God enlightens them, that somehow through our hearts we see the Lord, we acknowledge, recognize his presence, and it moves us to transform. It moves us to transformation. Be transformed by, thank you, Barbara, uh, enlightened. I love that word as well. Be enlightened. Um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church has a beautiful paragraph on the heart, and it references scripture, which likes to reference the heart quite a bit. In fact, the heart is the most referenced human organ in all of scripture. A close second, believe it or not, actually I'll ask you in the chat box, what do you think the second most um, noted organ in the human body is in sacred scripture? See if you can guess. Go ahead and use the chat box. Some people guess eyes. Some people guess the brain. It's actually your bowels, this idea of a gut feeling about God. And we know we have an enteric system, a nervous system in our bowels that is a part of our how we've evolved, uh, how God has created us and how we've evolved, uh, as well as that amygdala in our brain. But strong feelings about how God is moving us and to pay attention to some of those feelings, to truly have a biblical gut feeling about God or what God is calling us to do in our lives. So about the heart, the church and scripture says it's a place of encounter. It's a place where God comes to meet us. It's a place of covenant. It's where we make decisions for or against God. Um, it's a secret place. The heart's the one of the most vulnerable things about us. And we think about heart attacks, how serious that can be, you know, fatal even. And, and just if anything, any kind of damage to the heart and how that just affects the entire the entire body. The heart is such a vital organ. And because of that, it's such a vulnerable place. But what a perfect place for Christ to meet us in our vulnerability. So why is it so important to see it as God sees? That was one of our questions at the beginning. Seeing as God sees helps us see the truth of what's going on, the truth of our lives, the truth of others, the truth of, of creation, the truth of who God is. And it's something we can't see on our own. And we'll talk about why a little bit later, but when we see it, that truth, as Jesus says, sets us free. In John chap chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus talks about uh, living abundantly. Uh, he's come to, to give us life and to give it abundantly. Uh, part of that abundance is living in the truth, knowing where God is in your life, how he loves you, how he's moving you from day to day, how he leads you as the good shepherd. That's part of what the, the kind of vision that a disciple needs to develop to be able to see and spot where the Holy Spirit is moving them in their lives. The Jesuits uh, are very practiced in this notion of discernment, not that other religious orders aren't. They just have a particular charism with spiritual direction and, and religious discernment and really paying attention to how God is moving, moving us. And part of the way we pay attention is listening to our feelings, listening to the thoughts that paying attention to the thoughts that come to mind, particularly during prayer, uh, but also to look for God in everything. That's a, that's a motto from Ignatius, to find God in everything. And sometimes it's really difficult. <laughs> that's why we need to become practitioners. It's difficult anyway, but particularly when life is, is hard or exceptionally um, difficult for us, it is hard to, to find God in those moments. Uh, but when we do, boy, is that a joy. Boy, do we experience that abundance of living. And it speaks to a, a really core truth of the gospel and what a truth actually that we heard within those um, 
uh, teachings of Jesus from the Sermon on the Plain. Okay, that was the gospel for the sixth Sunday of ordinary time. And he talked about blessed are those who are hungry, blessed are those who are poor, blessed are those who are uh, disparaged and um, pe who are spoken against and people make fun of because of their faith in Jesus. Implied in all that is that part of living as a disciple is accepting that most of the time our external circumstances don't change or they're not changing anytime soon or no matter how hard we work to change them there's only so much we can do to control uh, those circumstances we don't have a whole lot of control over life uh, and, and we've seen that in kind of in stark relief over the last two years in dealing with this pandemic but what we do have what if we can't change our environment our context we can't change the view so to speak we can change how we look at it and it's not just a technique it's just what we're called to do as disciples to discover the truth of god's presence in the midst of ordinary circumstances of life or sometimes very difficult circumstances to recognize and believe and take solace in the fact that even in those difficult moments god is still present that's living in abundance it has nothing to do with material success or wealth or fame or power or this or that, uh, which we seem to as a society to really champion. It has more to do with recognizing the truth that no matter what God is present, God is with us. What I'd like to do is, is start a discussion. It can be as brief as you wish, uh, but just a reflection question here for you to consider and then go ahead and put any thoughts in the chat box about it. How can seeing the truth of things lead to more abundant living? How can seeing the truth of things lead to more abundant living? Let's take a moment. I'm writing right now. You open yourself up to the word of God. Thank you, Rachel. We'll give Barb a chance here. Okay. Well, just keep thinking about that. This, this uh, discernment and reflection doesn't have to end with our retreat today. Hopefully it's something you want to carry forward as you begin to learn and to practice seeing more as God does. Now on the screen, we have an image of St. Francis, and this is during a moment in his life when he has just fought in a civil war between Assisi and the Papal States, and he's returning from battle and returning from imprisonment. Uh, and he's on his horse and he's riding back to his easy and he sees a leprous person. And we all know that uh, leprous people were perceived as pariah. They were perceived as um, people that were cursed by God uh, because of their illness. This isn't um, particular to medieval mores and, and imagination and we find that same kind of thinking back in jesus's day right when he goes to heal the blind man the uh, at the temple and uh, the pharisees are sure that he, he either he or his parents did something horrible which is why god has allowed him to be so uh struck with blindness and we know that that's not how god operates we know that it's not as if um god curses us uh, but that imagination was alive and well in francis's time and instead of going away or moving his horse around the leprous person, right? Maybe far around the leprous person because they're not sure how that disease spreads. They just know they want to stay far away. He goes right, he gets off his horse and walks to the man and embraces him. And he, he felt compelled to do that. Um, he felt compelled to embrace the very thing uh, that he feared which ultimately leprosy represented death, right? It wasn't something that you most often recovered from. In fact, very rarely did you. Um, and most of the time it did lead to some other kind of illness or disease and ultimately to death. But Francis embraces this man. He gets back on his horse 
looks back to the to the man and all of a sudden he's gone. Francis wonders, is this an angel? Was this God that visited me? What, what was this all about? And it's a it's an incredible moment for him. And I'm putting these words in Francis's mouth. It's it's the first time that we see him seeing with his heart, uh, that we see him looking for Christ, looking for guidance from the Holy Spirit in the, in this particular situation. And it changes him. And he starts to have more encounters with God after this. He starts to hear God speak to him as he makes camp in a broken down chapel uh, just outside of Assisi. God's saying to him, rebuild my church. Francis interpreting that as, well, let's fix this chapel. <laughs> but God had much bigger plans for Francis, which he later realized. But this moment here with the leprous person sets off this way of seeing life, the world, looking for God now with vigilance, listening for God with vigilance, and then following the cues. So we, not just saints, every one of us has, because of, because of our baptism, because of our faith, we're called to look for God in, in everyday situations. And I'm going to share a story with you. And I'd like to know uh, if you have a story of uh, your faith helping you to see something or someone or some situation differently. So here's my story. Uh, I used to be an avid jogger. And one day I decided I'm going to double the distance of my run. And I was pretty confident in my ability and training and all of that. Um, I did not ask for God's help whatsoever. I thought this is a feat that I can accomplish. So I set out to do it and I, needless to say, I did not make, make it the double the distance. <laughs> the next day I decided to try again, but I realized having, having realized kind of painfully, I don't have enough strength myself. I don't have enough resources myself to make this trip, to make this journey, this jog. I need your help, Lord, please help me. So about halfway through the run, the second time, I come across and I we're, we were, we live near these country, like on the rural, you know, a lot of rural area around us, these country roads. And on the side of the road, there were two sticks just kind of lying on each other, like in a cross shape. And I paused for a second, bent down and picked them up. And with the eyes of my heart, I really saw this as a sign that God was accompanying me on this particular jog. And it inspired me, that belief. It filled me with not only his love, it, it really lightened everything about that run, which, you know, if you've ever ran for a while, it starts to take its toll in so many different ways, that lactic acid and the muscles and everything else. But everything about it felt lighter. And I made that double the distance run. Got, and I actually took the sticks with me, came home, put them on my nightstand. That's an example of trying to see as God sees using that cardio vision, allowing faith to be the context through which we see our lives. Uh, now, how many other people or cars could just pass those sticks on the side of the road and not notice them? Or if they notice them, not make those connections with faith or Jesus or anything like that. The question is, will you, the next time this, this situation presents itself? And, they, and God shows up so many times throughout our day we often talk about, well, God doesn't feel near to me, or I haven't seen God in a long time, or, you know, working in my life. But I always respond with, well, tell me how, how are you looking for God? What are you doing to open the eyes of your heart and, and be transformed by the things that you're seeing? So what I'd like to do is take a moment. Is there a story you have where faith has helped you to see something or someone in a new light? Go ahead and put that in the chat box. I'll just wait a little bit. If you don't have, if you don't want to use the chat box, that's fine, and we'll just keep moving on. But I want to give you an opportunity. Okay. 
So what I'd like to do with you now is a little meditation exercise. What you have in front of you is a mosaic, which you'll find behind the altar in the sanctuary of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, so it's the National Shrine Basilica there on the campus of Catholic University in Washington, DC. And students like myself one time would refer to this image of Jesus as angry Jesus. Um, if you get into the basilica and you, and you look at this image from far away, it's like super imposing. <laughs> the face looks very severe um, and uh, it's intimidating. And it makes you wanna like walk from left to right to try to get out of Jesus's gaze. Um, I, the first time I visited the basilica, I spent some time looking at this particular mosaic and the, there was a tour guide there that asked me to um, walk down the main aisle of the basilica and keep my eyes focused on the picture or the face of Jesus. So. What you see, and I could not capture it very well here, but it's a concave shape. And if you're right underneath it, because of like light and depth perception and things, Jesus's face looks far less severe. His eyes are really rounded orbs and it looks much more welcoming. And I asked the tour guide what that was all about. And he said, well, for those who think they're far away from Jesus, i.e. standing at the very back of the Basilica, they're going to think they see angry Jesus, and they're going to believe God to just be a vengeful, angry God. But those who've encountered Jesus, and just like in almost every encounter in the Gospels is one of mercy, they know that mercy of God. They know the heart of Jesus Christ, which is a heart of compassion and goodness and love. And they're going to see that face of the Good Shepherd, that more gentle face, they're going to see the roundness of the eyes. They're going to see the sincerity and the welcome there on the face of Jesus. I was blown away by that. What a, I didn't realize, I just thought that was such a catechetical thing for, to do with architecture. Like that was amazing <laughs> with art and architecture. So um, here's the meditation, what I'd like for, you to, for us to do. Let's close our eyes. Take a few breaths. Imagine that Jesus comes into your space right now. I don't know where you are, but I imagine you're in a room somewhere. Imagine he comes into the room where you are. What does he look like? How does he look at you? How do you feel when he looks at you? What does he look like? How does he look at you? And how do you feel when he looks at you? Go ahead and put those things in the chat box if you'd like. I would like to give you an opportunity. What does he look like? How does he look at you? And how do you feel when he looks at you? Comforted. Thank you, Rachel. This practice of using our imagination is not uh, a matter of uh, childishness or playfulness or pretend. I, I, in fact, I can't stand it when we think when we when we make imagination and pretending synonyms. Uh, they're just not, um, you know, God created us in his image and likeness. We are reflections. He imagined us, if you will, He thought about us and spoke us into being. And when we think about God and when we speak about God, we can also, in a sense, see God manifest in our life. Imagination is this plugging into our, that cardiovision, the sight of the heart. And when your heart is clear, when your heart is light, uh, when we do these meditations, people will say, well, Jesus looks very loving at me and very confident. And one thing I assure people of is that if you take the meditation seriously, it's really hard to fool yourself into saying, well, I just, I just would like him to see me that way. So that's how I saw him. Um, if you're taking the meditation seriously, you're going to allow that imagination to guide you to wherever it wants to go. And for some people, they'll write, you know, Jesus it looks down, Jesus looks upset, Jesus looks, and it's very interesting to 
converse with people about those imaginings about what God looks like and how he looks at them. Uh, but it does tell us something about our heart and how our heart's doing, the condition of our heart. Um, so this is a wonderful exercise to kind of take the temperature of things from time to time. Uh, another one, which doesn't have to do with imagining per se, uh, but I did learn it as spending time on a 30 day Jesuit retreat. It's just putting your fingers on your radial pulse and feeling that heartbeat. And with every pump of the heart, just saying to yourself that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. God not only imagines us into being, he holds us in being. Scripture tells us that. So he's constantly thinking about us. If God stopped thinking about us, we would no longer exist, as the, as the church fathers said, and many, many theologians have said. So God's thought is always bent on us, and he has plans for our prosperity and not our woe, as the prophet Jeremiah tells us. So why do we need to practice this cardiovision and really seeing life, seeing ourselves through the lens of faith? Why doesn't it just happen naturally? Or why doesn't it just happen, you know, after we're baptized, we just sort of have this faculty now? Why do we really have to, to be intentional about trying to see uh, with the gift of faith, see through, the, through our hearts, if you will? Well, an easy answer is right here in the picture which goes back to the original sin, the fall of Adam and Eve. We talk a lot of times about sin um, in terms of what you should not do or what you should do but fail to do. Uh, so there's, it's very action oriented how we think about sin, but what we don't often talk about are the effects of sin. And three of them listed here, and the first two have to do with each other. Sin really distorts the picture of things. It distorts our vision. You think about any time someone sins against you, uh, our field of vision tends to narrow, and we only see the person as the sin he or she committed. So if someone gossips about you, then our field of vision shrinks. And when we see that person, we say she or he is a gossiper. Like we identify them with the sin. So that view of the person just starts to go away and all we see is what has happened to us and that that person is the cause and so one of the reasons why jesus stresses over and over in the gospels do not judge people because you don't you don't have that god's eye view if you will how hard it is for us when damage has been done when injustice has happened to retain a vision of the person who's perpetrated the problem, crime, sin, whatever. It's hard to keep in mind that they are a human person or that group are human beings or whatever it is um, who's ever instigated the problem. Uh, do not judge. Allow God to take care of, of that. And now it doesn't mean we don't judge evil things, evil actions. You know, we, there's plenty of commandments that we need to be looking at. And I love how the catechism has really dug into, gotten deep into each of those commandments. For example, thou shall not kill. Uh, the church will talk about in the catechism that also includes don't destroy people's reputation. You know, don't don't think it's OK to uh, defame people. Uh, you know, there's there has to be just cause, circumstances and et cetera. But all that aside, this is an immorality class. It's all simply to say that when sin enters into the picture, the picture becomes distorted, but it can also be distorted in different ways. So if we're the ones that are struggling with sin or a habit or whatever is going on, then that focus of life is still distorted because it's, it's very much focused on me and what I want and not what others may want. It's a very self-focused picture. It's out of focus. If it were in focus, it would have the big picture, which I like to call God's eye view of things. You know, he's got pretty big, you know, it's kind of see, he's talking about him having the whole world in his hands. Well, he sees everything too. And he sees uh, all through it and inside of it uh, and all around it. Um, but this is something we don't talk about when we talk about sin, how it, it distorts our perceptions of reality. It's also why some people become extremely ashamed uh, with their sin. There's nothing that God, God does not want to shame us. God wants us to recognize the guilt. Uh, as he says to many people in scripture, sin no more but it doesn't mean to think that you're an awful person and all this other stuff that is the distortion that comes with sinning also and finally division 
So sin doesn't bring people together. It certainly divides them. And there isn't a better Lexio to do than this little section here from Genesis 3. So take a moment to look at that. This is where uh, Eve and Adam decide to eat of the fruit of the forbidden tree. I can't click on the screen or it will advance the slide, but if you can see my cursor at all, right here, this would be verse seven. Then the eyes of both were opened. So they've, it's, it's, but it's like an, it's not a real opening of the eyes like we saw back in Ephesians 1.18, enlighten the eyes of our hearts. This is a false opening of the eyes to seeing who they are. Well, now they're naked. And there's a shame connected with that. And, and St. John Paul II really drew on this particular passage uh, as a basis for his entire theology of the body, which has had, I think, a profound effect on, or an impact on how people um, understand sex and human, human nature now. Um, but this idea that now there's shame in the picture where there wasn't shame before. And if you continue on in, uh, with verses eight and following, Adam and Eve turn on each other, you know, they, they, they blame each other. They blame the serpent for what happened. And uh, it's, it's just an awful picture. Sin distorts and divides. It does not help us see the truth of things. It does not help us to have that cardio vision. And because of that, we cannot live abundantly. We're not going to take a break because this is not the two and a half hour <laughs> version. What I'd like to do now is talk about how God does see us. So there's lots of ways that God looks at us and we can find them in scripture, but I chose three. God sees us as his children. He sees our need to be loved and accepted. And he also sees our potential for goodness and greatness. I'd like to take a moment here and look at these two verses, passages. Go ahead and note any words or phrases that jump out at you. Hinder. Thank you, Rachel. I'm. I just. I love the fact that, and I'm fascinated by the fact that Jesus, you know, he admonishes his disciples for not understanding that the kingdom of heaven uh, is really made for the children of the Father. Right. This is about the family home. That's what heaven is. And uh, it, it makes me it fascinates me because what is it about children that so suits them for the kingdom of God? You know, what do you think that is? Thank you, Barbara, for receive there. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with their innocence. A lot of it, though, has to do with their their vision, their way of seeing and believing things that aren't there, their openness to that this wide orientation to all possibilities that somehow as we grow up that field of vision just narrows and narrows exactly barbara it, they're open that field of vision just keeps narrowing and it's it's really unfortunate and here the disciples had to be reminded to open your eyes open the eyes of your heart um this isn't about and of course it's this is coming at a time when the disciples are murmuring amongst themselves about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of god so <laughs> jesus is like boy you guys are way off base you, you don't even understand what's happening in front of you you're not using your hearts to see the plan of god unfolding right before your eyes in fact god himself who's standing here in front of you also god sees our need to be accepted and loved here we have 
very colorful image of Zacchaeus in the tree. Just so you know, by way of context, I am in a room in my house that is freezing uh, and I have an electric blanket on that's really not working. So I hope wherever you are, it's comfortable, warm, and it's helping you with this uh, with this retreat, giving you more of a relaxed mindset. But if you see me looking fidgety, it's because I'm surprised I don't see my breath as I give this retreat. <laughs> so we have a colorful image here of Zacchaeus who scripture tells us climbs a tree in order to see Jesus who's just entered town. Um, we know who Zacchaeus is. Uh, we know what he does. Uh, he takes uh, off the top from the taxes he collects. So he cheats his own people. He works for the Romans, which are enemies of the Jewish people at this point. They're the occupiers of the Jewish homeland. And uh, here Jesus comes. And there's one verse in the telling of the story of Zacchaeus that just, just this year, and it's so funny, we, we read scripture, we hear the stories uh, over and over, uh, perhaps in, on, during Sunday mass, and you're like, yeah, I know that, I know what happens. And then every once in a while, you get a detail that just blows you away. Well, this was one of them. And Luke tells us in this one verse, he, he says, and Jesus looked up at Zacchaeus. What's so amazing about that? What's so revelatory about that? Well, think about it. Everyone knows who this man is. Like the leper in St. Francis, this man is a pariah. It's his own fault because of his employment and how he cheats his, his own people with collecting more than, than the taxes needed. This is a marginalized person. Everyone in the town looks down at him. But Luke wants us to know that Jesus looked up at him. I think he's the only one in town who would ever look up at a man like Zacchaeus, look up and see him, see more than the tax collector, see the man. Zacchaeus, you know, just imagining uh, Zacchaeus seeing the, the gaze of Jesus coming down from the tree, meeting Jesus in the town square, being honest about what he's done, and then saying, I'm going to give back more than what the law requires. Just being seen by God, seeing and God seeing Zacchaeus' need for acceptance and for love transformed him. This uh, seeing as God sees just transforms our lives. When our hearts are looking for that gaze from God, sometimes it comes right at us and just changes our lives. Um, maybe you have a story or a moment when you've not necessarily met God's gaze, but you've had an experience of God working in your life that has absolutely transformed you, that you were looking for that experience. Somehow you were aware of that experience happening. Otherwise, it probably wouldn't have much of an impact on you. But this meeting Christ and hearing Christ uh, and seeing Christ's gaze transforms Zacchaeus. And as Jesus said at the very end, salvation has come to you, to your household. I'd like to do another Lexio experience with you. God sees our potential. God sees our potential for goodness, for greatness. And I'd also like to tell a personal story as part of the reflection, but take a moment. Here we have a passage from John and note any words or phrases that speak to you. I, I remember the first time I read this passage, um, I'm a kind of a literal thinker sometimes. Uh, for example, when I was a kid, I remember my mom taking me to mass and bef the old missile, uh, one of our responses was, only say the word and my soul shall be healed. And I used to yank on my mom's arm and I'd say, what's the word, <laughs> right? And there's like this secret word that's supposed to heal us. I'd like to know what that is so I can say it and be healed. And she just used to laugh at me. Um, here, I'm thinking, what a, what greater miracles could we possibly do? What things could we possibly do 
even with Jesus' help, that would be greater than the things he did. Well, uh, believe it or not, we are called to be these miracle workers that Jesus sets us out to be. We may not feel like such or believe that, uh, but when we do work with him, when we allow his grace to work with us, I should say, uh, the greatest miracle can occur. And that I submit to you is to, to change somebody else's heart, starting with our own. It is a cooperative effort, us and God. Um, but to change the human heart, to move it around, to come back to, to that, to meet the gaze of Jesus, where maybe it has turned away from and needs to come back and connect with, or to see that gaze for the first time. Uh, that's an extraordinary feat. Uh, and in some respects, more important than walking on water or uh, healing lepers, as important as all those miracles are. You know, we do need and ask for physical healings, but at our core is the spirit and the spiritual needs. And when it comes right down to it, one of the most important needs is that our faith continue to be fed and that faith continues to provide a vision for the rest of our lives. Like we saw in that very first verse from Acts, we live and move and have our being in Jesus Christ. Faith is the orientation for our lives. So if our faith is no good, or if it's weak, or if it's this or that, we really need to beg God for the grace to correct that. Uh, you think about what it takes to change people's minds, we say, or change people's hearts, um, particularly about God. It's incredible um, because there are so many things uh, to the contrary. There are so many forces in our world and so many uh, phenomena in our society that would suggest that God is not around and that God, if he did care at one time, has stopped caring. Uh, so to be able to see that that's not true and to say with conviction, God is alive. He is here. He is among us. That's an extraordinary feat. That's it. That's the greatest miracle next to next to the resurrection itself of Jesus, without which our faith is pointless, as scripture tells us to be a part of those those miracle workings. And I think we do that when we can see when we try to look for the potential in others. And here's my story about that. So I used to be the adult faith formation director at a parish uh, in Rockville, Maryland, and uh, I had a person in my uh, who came to all my events, we'll call her Catherine, who was just very hard to deal with. And I know I can be hard to deal with too. We all can. But um, for example, we, Catherine would be in a small group and soon it would dissolve because she can be dominating in the conversations. And she's also felt very free to kind of tell people where they're wrong and, and it, it, people felt kind of judged by her. And it was just a difficult situation. Um, so five years of trying to work with Catherine, and I'm sure she felt like she was trying to work with me and <laughs> make me better. And in a way she did, in a way she did. So at the end of those five years, the parish threw a reception for me because I was moving on uh, to another assignment. And uh, Catherine showed up and she comes up to me and she kind of looks like this, you know, she looks at me and, and then she says, you know, you make the sign of the cross way too fast. You know, you always rush your prayers. And then she kind of looks around as like, as if to remember she's at a reception and she says, so I guess I should say something nice to you. Uh, this wasn't the worst event that you've had in five years. And I'm like, oh, first of all, I didn't put this event on. So what a nice backhanded compliment that was. And I just wanted to let her have it verbally, uh, filled with so much frustration. When we are in those moments, whether it's a Catherine or whoever or whatever's happening. And it's the last impulse we have. Sometimes we want to try to remind ourselves and be ready to call upon either a story from scripture that really gives us comfort and reminds us God is present in the moment or a verse from scripture or a prayer uh, or, or even drawing on your own personal uh, journey with God in the past where God has shown up during moments of crisis. We have to have those ready at hand. And scripture even tells the, says that the disciples need to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in them. Just be ready because you never know when that moment's going to come that we have to offer a witness. And in that moment, the only thing I could muster was Jesus, like the, the word, the name Jesus. And I just said it to myself probably three or four times. And you know what happened? I saw Catherine 
And I saw more of Catherine than I'd seen before. I saw more of a God's eye view of Catherine. And what I mean by that is I had suddenly remembered how Catherine was involved in ministries that many people either did not want to do or could not do for, for whatever reason. Catherine didn't have any family. She, her parish was the family. Um, and, but she was a very generous person. And I was reminded of that in the moment. So instead of letting her have it, I said to her, um, I want to thank you, Catherine, for everything that you do here. And she was like about bowled her over. And then she just walks away. And then about a month later, the pastor called me and said, Hey, do you know who's like your biggest uh, fan who thinks you're just the best adult faith formation director we ever had? Yeah, it's Catherine. It's Catherine. And I couldn't believe it, but I also thought about, I wonder how many people have said kind words to her. I wonder how many other people have tried to see more of her, to see more of her as God sees her. And that's really the call here, folks, today on retreat, is to begin to practice this cardio vision, this way of seeing with our faith. We're going to have to keep moving here uh, so that we can be transformed by it. Okay, mercy. We're going to keep using this sight metaphor, our corrective lenses. One of my favorite uh, encounters with Jesus in the Gospels is when he's at Simon the Pharisee's house and there's a woman there with an alabaster jar and she she's known by Simon anyway to be a sinful woman and anoints Jesus' feet with her tears and dries them with her hair. And and one of my favorite lines, and again, I can't, I can't click on the slide or it will advance, is on the second bullet in the italics, Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see her the way that I do? Between the two of you, in other words, she's the one who's showing me hospitality. She's the one that's being a good, righteous person in this moment, not you, not you, because she's doing these things where you did not do those things, right? And it just kind of bowls him over. And of course, what precipitates this is Simon says to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? <laughs> well, here you go, right here. She showed up unexpectedly. Of course, God expected her. We don't have time to do Alexia here, but I just wanted to call out this wonderful line. Do you see her? Mercy helps us to see uh, the potential in people, helps us to see people the way God does, to remember that they are children of God, to remember their need for love and acceptance and to remember the potential for greatness they have. Mercy makes room in our hearts for new insights, right? Uh, mercy helps uh, to level set. A wonderful phrase is, uh, I use it all the time, is there but for the grace of God go I. Um, and I already told the Catherine story, so we'll skip that. But it starts with humility, doesn't it? It starts with recognizing that I don't see the way God wants me to see, and then moving from there to be guided to seeing things differently and being transformed by it. We asked this question earlier, so we're not gonna do it now. And this leads us to the last part of this retreat. And it's great because we have seven minutes left. So here on the left, we have the divine mercy image, which we find in the diary of St. Faustina Kowalska. And then on the right, we have a monstrance with the Eucharist in it. And those same rays of blood and water coming out. And here's the story that really kind of brings this all together and leads us to thinking about how do we learn to see as God sees. Again, not a technique, but just a way of relating to God, since it is about relationship, it's not about technique. So when I was a uh, director of religious education and youth minister uh, in Muskogee, Oklahoma, I've been around quite a bit, um, I was in the office one day and a, a woman just barges in the door and she's out of breath and she's asking to see where the adoration chapel is. So I take her there. She starts crying as she kneels down, you know, she, she's really bothered and I'm trying to find out what's going on. And then in walk her husband and their daughter, daughter's probably 13, 14 at the time. So the husband explains to me that um, my wife has been sick with a rare terminal cancer. Um, we've gone all over the country looking for cures and remedies and nothing's working and we're passing through Muskogee on our way back home. Uh, and he says, you know, we really need a cure. And interestingly enough, the wife says, I want to know what it's like to see Jesus. 
I want to know what it's like to see Jesus. That's what she said. And the husband said, I want, we, we want a cure. So keep that in mind. Keep those two things in mind. So we pray together. And as you can imagine, as I'm praying, you're, I'm thinking, my goodness, if there were ever conditions for a miracle here, we have them. Uh, we have a woman of great faith. Uh, and one of the other things I failed to mention was um, these, they were not Catholic. Um, the night before they had been watching TV and the wife told me that they saw um, a nun talking about the Eucharist. So they had been watching EWTN, the Catholic channel, and they opened the phone book and found St. Joseph's, uh, which is the only, uh, really it's the only church in Muskogee, the only Catholic church. And it's certainly the only one with perpetual adoration uh, around for miles and miles and miles. So that's why they were there. Uh, and I said, Lord, here's a woman of great faith. She's not even Catholic. She's coming to you <clears throat> like the woman with the hemorrhage who wants to touch her, the tassels of your robe. You just heal her like you've done so many with so many others. And then Father Brian Brooks came and uh, offered the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. And, uh, you know, we continue to pray. And then after a while, I just decided to take my leave. Later that night, early morning, uh, Father Brooks called me and said, well, I just wanted you to know that she passed. So thank you so much. It meant a lot to the husband and daughter that you were there. Uh, but I wanted you to know that she passed away. I was so devastated by this. Not, not, just, not just the normal sort of <coughs> struggles with death and dealing with loss <coughs> and grief and that sort of thing. But I, had, I felt like we'd all prayed so ardently for this miracle right we all wanted a miracle to happen well three days of feeling pretty low because of this experience and frankly because i was not seeing what god was doing in that moment <clears throat> that sunday at mass i remember praying and i kind of in my mind's eye if you will saw <coughs> i apologize it's just dry down here i saw that woman in my imagination and she was facing me and praying for me and i just kind of said to myself well what is this about and sort of the answer inside was, well, she's praying for you. She wanted you to know she got her miracle. She got what she wanted. And that's when my mind went back to what the husband said and what the wife said as to the reason why they were there. He was there because he wants a cure. She's there because she wants to know what it's like to see Jesus. She was preparing herself. She was ready to go. She, she was looking for perpetual adoration because a nun she saw on TV told her of, in the entire world, this is the closest you'll be to Jesus Christ. That's why she was there. She was ready to go home, right? She's ready to be that child of God and enter the kingdom. And all that realization came to me and I was so humbled by it. About a month later, Father Brooks phoned me and said that the husband and daughter had since enrolled in RCIA back home. And I thought, oh, only God could work something so wonderful and beautiful out of something so terrible. And it reminded me, I need to start seeing things more as God does. So as I thought about that experience in Muskogee, I, I put together these steps, if you will. First, just acknowledging that we don't see as God sees for most of our day. <laughs> um, it really is a matter of intention and an invitation of the Holy Spirit to guide us as we move through the day so that we can start seeing God's way. Secondly, identifying what is my lens that I'm using or what's my frame of reference? Is it hurt? Is it pain? Is it I've got these things to do, duties, responsibilities? How are we looking at our day ahead of us? What is the category we use to define that day? And God's category is always the heart and mercy. Are you open to ex experiencing God's sudden surprises and where God just shows up, just like he showed up in Jericho and surprised everybody, especially Zacchaeus? Why did he even go there? Well, he wanted to see that particular guy because he needed to look up at him so that Zacchaeus could be accepted and be loved. We need to evaluate how our heart is. We can do this in many ways. I, I've been talking about Ignatian spirituality, so the examine is very important, and also an examination of conscience. We also need to offer up those things that are keeping us from seeing as God sees. A lot of that time it's pain, it's, it's sadness, it's 
frustration, it's apathy, uh, but we need to actually verbally uh, or at least mentally offer those blockages, spiritual blockages in our in our hearts, if you will, so that that can be cleared up and we can see the Lord a little bit better. We also have to accept that he does love us. Um, that's one of the hardest things to do. I think I've heard from so many people um, through my time in ministry say things like, you know, I'm 60 years old and I'm just now believing that God loves me. And I've been Catholic my whole life. I've heard that kind of statement in one way or another. Uh, it's in like an infinite amount of times, it seems. Finally, praising God. And, and that's a very difficult part too, particularly in a tough moment. Uh, there are seasons of, of praise, just like there are seasons, natural seasons, fall, spring, winter, summer. We don't always feel like praying, but even in those moments we don't feel like praying, to just get into scripture if we can, into a psalm of praise where we can just join our voice with the psalmist. Maybe we can't come up with our own words to praise God, but there are words there in scripture to help us. So we talked about what it means to see as God sees today. We talked about why this way of seeing is important and how we can start to see as God sees. Again, practice these steps. It's not a technique. I do want to leave a, a minute or two for questions. I know we're at one o'clock right now. So I want to thank you for your um, patience. And I also want to drop this, if it will happen here, this link in the chat box for you. Uh, there we go. So I recently finished my fifth book and it's called They Saw Through God's Eyes, An Invitation from the Saints. And in this book, let me just exit out of this. We look at 12 different saints and 12 contemporary people and how they came to see something about themselves or others as God sees it. And there are prayers and reflection questions. Um, I, I'm really excited about this. This is my first foray into spirituality writing. Um, the author, the publisher is the word among us, but I dropped a link in there. It's on Amazon as well. So I'd like to leave a second or two or a moment or two for some questions or comments. Um, go ahead and use that chat box. Our time has flown as I knew it would. I want to thank you for participating in the chat. Um, there's nothing worse than opening it up and nobody says anything. So thank you for being merciful to me. <laughs> and are there any questions or comments that I could answer quickly? Okay. Well, I also want to thank NCEA on behalf of Sadler for allowing me to do this retreat. And i um, really appreciative of that relationship. So thank you again to all and God bless. Thank you, Matt. Um... It's a really informative retreat and um, very positive uh, approach to this topic. And um, congratulations on your book too. Thanks. Um, I don't know when that when that was published exactly, but um, it'll, it'll be out early April. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we're hopeful that the people will get that and be able to get more out of that in the, in this uh, with you know thinking about their relationship with God and their walk through life. Um, so in, if you had any final things you wanted to say in closing or. Um, I'd like to close uh, the prayer if that's okay. Sure. All right. In the name of the father and the son and the Holy spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God. You give us the gift of our hearts to not only love you, but to see the love you have for us. Help us to open the eyes of our hearts to see your love and to be a sign of that love for others. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks again, Matt. And um, for those of you who are on the webinar with us, um, just wanted to point out um, our convention, uh, NCA convention, is taking place in April 19th through the 21st in new orleans and we're going to be in person for the first time in two years Yay! and uh, <laughs> as uh people are getting back to to their lives as they were before or, or making the best effort to do so um if you want more information about the convention it's nca.org nca 2022 
Again, thanks, Matt. And uh, we will see everyone. Feel free to join us for future webinars. They're listed on the NCEA website at ncea.org slash webinars. Thank you and have a blessed day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.